day. Okay, great. So welcome to the Urban Ecology Collaborative. We are a group of groups focused in the New England and Mid-Atlantic regions. We meet virtually on the third Wednesday of each month to talk about urban forestry and other related topics. Um, we have a forum for sharing about upcoming events, research, jobs, urban forestry topics, and we have recorded meetings on our YouTube channel. Um, so today we are super excited to welcome Drew Powell, who is going to be talking to us about forest patches and heavy metals, the geographies of pollution, position in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm really excited also to start working with Drew. Drew has accepted a role on our policy team here at Mass Audubon and will be moving um, in a little bit up here, but um, is also uh, right now and just previously an MS student in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Drew is motivated by questions of environmental justice, community engagement, and forest ecology. His research agenda seeks to combine political ecology and physical geography. Drew's thesis focuses on an understanding of the use of trees as biomonitors, and specifically he seeks to investigate the role of forest patches in trapping and collecting patterns of air pollution across Baltimore. Um, Drew got a BS at Boston University in 2021 and will soon be back up with us as a climate policy analyst on our team at Mass Audubon. So with that, Drew, welcome. Thank you so much for being here and um, feel free to share your slides. Uh, actually, before we begin, Erica, may, may I? You certainly I may. To, <laughs> thank you. Hi, it's David from Speak for the Trees. Um, and thank you for joining us today, Drew. If I may just take a couple of minutes here. If folks have announcements, sometimes it's, it's helpful to have them at the beginning because I know people might uh, be leaving, um, might have to leave a certain time during the meeting. So just open up the floor for people to share any exciting news or things that might be of interest to the group before we turn it over to you, if that's okay, Drew. That is actually a really good point, David. Um, if I could start, I have an, a little announcement. Um, we... I know you do. You always do, Erica. <laughs> I know you know I do. Um, so in Boston, um, actually with David and a bunch of other organizations, we kicked off a um, an alliance with the city of Boston on Friday, um, planted a microforest at the Boston Nature Center, but we are starting up an alliance to address um, inequities and deficiencies in tree canopy on private land across the city of Boston. So we're excited to kind of convene a bunch of groups, pass through some federal dollars and um, get some trees planted and maintained on private properties in the city. So we were super excited Excited to kick that off and uh, the mayor got got to planting um, in the microforest which was really exciting as well as power core boston so really looking to collaborate with as many people as possible on the project and um, thank you david thank you everyone else who served as kind of good models for this um, across the kind of regions that we discussed so really excited and i will open the floor for other people with announcements <laughs> That's a that's a that's a, a silent surprise. Maybe all the busy people are out doing things, and the rest of us have nothing to say because I don't know. We're not. I I would say uh, we're moving our offices in two weeks down the street. We're moving to a bigger space. We're super excited for that. So um, hopefully we'll have an office welcoming party in early June. Um, and would love to see as many of you there as possible. We live in the Boston area. Um, and we're still looking to hire an associate director. The information's on our website. Associate director would be in charge of um, ensuring that projects are running on track and on budget, sort of a project manager job, but we're a small team of five or six people. So we're looking for someone who can uh, carry a lot of hats or wear a lot of hats, I should say, and juggle a lot of balls. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity here to sort of co-create the position as well. I'll drop the link in the chat window. Thanks, David. I see Mike. Go ahead. Good morning. <clears throat> um, this is not a uh, this is not a well formed announcement, but it seemed like it it might be relevant just to get people's minds working. Um, so I, I think I presented when I presented here. I talked about work about urban tree canopy and cooling in DC a while back last year, something like that. 
And so we got some funding for this summer to expand that study because uh, the DC study was one day worth of temperature data in one city. And so not exactly generalizable results. So this summer we're working to do the same thing in, this is going to be an incomplete list, but I'll just go for it. Um, in Boston, uh, New York, Durham, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Richmond, and several other cities that I can't remember, uh, basically 10 cities within kind of this general Northeastern broadleaf deciduous zone where we have air temperature data and we can see if the relationships in DC uh, stand up and are, and are similar in other places. And the point, the point of this, why I'm saying this is that uh, we want part of this to be immediately useful. So if you are in one of these Eastern cities that I've mentioned, or uh, a few other ones that I can post in the chat later, um, it'd be good to, to hear from you because uh, we're interested in just like, you know, we'll publish something, but we would also say here, like, here are some products that may be useful directly, directly to you to inform um, planting practices. Awesome, Mike, congrats on that expansion. That's super exciting. We can't wait to use your work. Um, I see Danielle's hand next. Go ahead, Danielle. So many things to click through to, to get me back on here. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to offer, because we had a great announcement from David and a great announcement from Mike, if there's anything you want me to broadcast through my weekly newsletter, please feel free to send me things, um, job announcements, recruitment for partner cities or partners within cities, any of that kind of stuff. I'm happy to pass along with my forest service newsletter. And I do have the UEC um, group list as one of the recipients. So I also did want to flag that, although I do serve the states in the Northeast, which is New York and the new is the six New England states. There is a me down in the mid Atlantic that some of you might be working with and that's Julie May Hoarder. And so she covers Maryland and over to West Virginia, um, everything, Pennsylvania, everything like kind of like south of New York. So although my, my newsletter is focused on the Northeast, I'm happy to share um, things outside of my subregion as well. So um, I wanted to put in a plug for that. And then the other thing is, you know, in case you missed it, um, the deadline for the Inflation Reduction Act, UCF funding requests or the, the NOFO responses or the RFA responses, however you want to phrase it, um, that makes sense to you. Um, those applications are due on June 1st. So we are rapidly approaching that. Um, it is getting, it is ramping up. It is getting busy. Yes, um, a lot of us are either losing hair or our hair is changing color. Um, and so anyway, um, I, I did want to flag that we have a lot of really great resources on that um, application portal. Um, so check out the FAQs. These FAQs were updated based on questions that were coming in through the inbox. Um, uh, which has been closed because they had started getting a lot of repeat questions that were already being answered in the FAQs. So for sure, use that as your first stop shop if you have questions as you're navigating the application process. And if you get stuck and cannot find the answer to what you're looking for on that website, you can certainly reach out to myself or to Julie if you are in um, the more mid-Atlantic region. If you don't know what state is served by whom, and you just want to reach out to me, I can pass you on to the right person. So don't be shy. Um, and that's all I have. <laughs> Thanks so much, Danielle. I guess one thing from a smaller city is also that Worcester in Massachusetts, which is in the top three largest cities in Mass, um, they just have their draft forest plan, their first um, urban forestry master plan. Um, the comments were due yesterday on the on the draft that's publicly released. So just um, wanted to, to shout that out as well, that more cities in um, Massachusetts are creating urban forest master plans and trying to ramp up what they're doing in urban forestry. And also we're all looking at that um, June 1st deadline for uh, to see what, what can happen in places that aren't typically represented on the call or um, in other efforts. So um, thanks, great announcements. And I think we will um, now transition to Drew unless anyone has a last hand to raise. Um, but again, we have Drew Powell here to present some research about trees. And um, Drew, if you wanna go ahead, I think we're ready and excited to hear from you. Thanks. 
Okay, awesome. Can you see my screen? Sorry, sorry. Just to, sorry. I'm second time I'm doing this. If folks uh, want to just share their their where they're from in the chat window, I don't want to take a time away from Drew. Uh, it's sometimes helpful for us to introduce ourselves that way because uh, there are some new names of people I don't know here. So Drew, that's it. I'm not going to interrupt you again. No worries. Um, I think it's helpful to have announcements. I really like hearing announcements. It's also helpful to know who you're talking to, <laughs> especially like in the Zoom world. Um, so I really appreciate it. But hello, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Um, and thank you so much, Erica, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to share some of my research with y'all. Um, my name is Drew Powell. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm a grad student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, and I'm in the Geography and Environmental Systems Department. Um, it's kind of funny because GES just celebrated 50 years as a department, um, and it's been a really great place to learn because I've been encouraged and allowed to ask interdisciplinary questions. Um, and so today I will be talking about my interdisciplinary question of using trees as biomonitors for air pollution. Um, and in order to jump into that, I wanted to do a quick um, air pollution 101. Um, and so I think when we hear the term air pollution, we usually think of a classic smokestack, right? So this big, tall thing with a very thick smog coming out of the top. Um, but really, air pollution describes any substance in the atmosphere that contributes to the contamination of the indoor environment or the outdoor environment. Um, and so while, yes, the smokestack is kind of a classic source of air pollution that we think of, um, there are really a lot of other places that air pollution comes from. Um, and so the three kind of big sources of pollution that tend to be a focus in terms of research um, are the agriculture sector, the industry sector, and transportation. And so in terms of agriculture, livestock, um, and the use of synthetic fertilizers can release methane and nitrogen, which upon entering our atmosphere can change into other pollutants such as ozone or ammonia, which can impair our breathing ability as well as limit our visibility. Um, and then the next kind of big source that to, to think about is um, industry, right? And so again, that kind of classic thing that we see in our minds, um, power plants and factories, which burn fossil fuels and can emit nitrogen oxides, carbon dioxides, which are um, a warming gas and also particulate matter or PM. And then finally on the right, we have transportation. And so transportation often is another form of fossil fuel combustion. And so again, um, particulate matter is a big side effect of it along with some of those warming pollutants. Here in Baltimore city proper, um, the latter has been classified as the areas of concern here. Um, Baltimore has a really large um, industrial history and continues to be an industrial city. We're actually home to one of the largest medical waste incinerators here in Baltimore City. Um, and it's actually considered a source of green energy um, because the thought is that we will just never run out of waste. Um, so it's renewable, I guess. Um, we also have a few large highways that cross through the city um, that kind of go both north and south as well as um, east and west. And so the EPA measures most of these pollutants um, but in my research, I focus specifically on PM due to the fact that our bigger pollutant sources are kind of here on the right and um, our big PM emitters. Um, when I say PM, I'm talking about particulate matter, which describes a form of air pollution that generally speaking is very small um, and in urban areas comes from fossil fuel combustion. Um, I focus on fine PM, so PM 2.5, which is 2.5 microns or less in diameter. Um, and to kind of conceptualize that, I have this visual from the EPA on the right, which depicts a human hair. Um, and on that human hair are these really small pink dots, which represent the size of PM 2.5, right? And so um, these little pink dots are about 1 20th of a human hair. And so they're really, really tiny. Um, but despite being so small, they can have really large health impacts. And oftentimes those health impacts tend to depend on the makeup of particulate matter, right? So um, things like black carbon or dust or heavy metals tend to have their own health concerns. Um, and so overall, um, I would say that PM can exacerbate a lot of pre-existing lung conditions such as um, COPD, which results in increased morbidity and mortality. It's small enough that sometimes it can enter the bloodstream 
um, and as a result has negative impacts on a person's lung and heart function. Um, NPM, again, generally tends to be made out of dust, soot, nitrates, or heavy metals. Um, and those heavy metals have um, specific health concerns, including cancer um, or immune system dysfunction. Um, and the EPA, as well as OSHA, have limits um, about how much heavy metals a person in a workspace is allowed to be um, exposed to. So in this work, we decided to look into heavy metals specifically um, because a lot of pollution studies that involve trees don't always speciate. But if each PM component has its own specific health risks, I think it's important to look into the composition, especially um, if different areas have different um, compositions of their PM, right? And so if Baltimore has a big heavy metal problem as a result of the industry and the traffic here, it might make sense to look specifically into the heavy metal concentrations. Um, and so I kind of talk a little bit about how Baltimore is heavy in industry and heavy in traffic. And there, those are kind of areas of concern for the city. Um, but to visually convey that on the right, we have a map of Baltimore City. Um, and I've plotted most of the industrial sources of air pollution. I actually used a website called OpenStreetMap, which allows people to tag or mark locations of stuff. Um, so it is contributor uh, controlled, I guess. Um, and so it's a little bit like an advanced Google Maps in that I can go in and, and use a tag to find everything. So if I wanted to look at every park bench in the city, I could use a tag that represented park benches and I'd get an accurate representation of it. Um, in this uh, map, everything in Baltimore that would be associated in industrial pollution is represented by a purple circle. Um, and the purple circles uh, were used to make a heat map, um, which depicts the density of those pollution sources. And so we have a, a lot of industry kind of in the center of Baltimore, but also um, out in the east of Baltimore. Uh, but there's also kind of a general fog um, over the entire city. Um, and this map is actually not inclusive of traffic, right? Which when we map traffic on top of this map, the entire the entirety of Baltimore is, is covered in a smog. Um, and it's actually kind of hard to see places that would be clear or um, clean. And so I think we know that urban areas tend to have a lot of traffic. Um, they tend to have a lot of people. Um, and in some cases, they have a lot of industry. And so if we're aware of the fact that um, industry and traffic are big contributors to pollution, um, and that they would have these really negative effects on large populations of people, I think it's important to kind of get a sense of what's going on. And so in order to tell that story, um, at least in this work, we use trees. Um, I think there's a large interest in the use of trees for improving air quality. Um, we know that trees can collect air pollution through a couple of mechanisms um, that I'll walk through in this graphic. Um, this graphic is based off of one made by Alexandra Panet Gonzalez. Um, she's over at the University of Utah. Um, but on the left here, we have wet deposition, which would be any form of precipitation. So rain or snow, which can actually be envelope pollution and deposit them onto leaf surfaces, which are generally thought to be um, kind of rinsed off and able to be collected in through fall, um, which are just collections of that precipitation under a tree. Um, and then the other mechanism that we think of is dry deposition, which is when loose particles in the air can actually kind of just land on a leaf surface. Um, so we would think that uh, a collection of a leaf sample could have that, that dry deposition or that dry pollution on the leaf surface. Um, and that whatever was deposited in that dry deposition could actually be rinsed off um, by the rain and be collected in that through fall, right? And so um, a few studies have found or concluded that it's through these mechanisms that trees can actually um, clean the air through pollution removal. Um, and many of those studies recommend trees in order to mitigate poor air pollution. Alternatively, though, there is another body of literature that has actually found the opposite. They have found that street trees or, or small forests um, can actually trap pollution and prevent it from dissipating into the air, right? Like a big buildup of canopy um, prevents the pollution that would be emitted um, from kind of like rising to the top because of, of those tree leaves or that really dense canopy. Um, and actually in some studies that compared air quality in small forested areas that were directly next to open areas found that the pollution was a little bit worse because of that entrapment. Um, some of the literature also kind of thinks about that 
as a, as a result of the placement of trees. And so whether we do individual trees compared to small forests, as well as um, thinking about tree species as a factor that can influence the effectiveness um, of that pollution mitigation. Um, I think that despite these kind of disagreements in the literature, um, we know that trees are picking up particulate matter um, and we know that particulate matter is depositing onto leaf surfaces. Um, I think that's important because it means that trees could be used as monitors to understand the state of air quality um, in a given area over a period of time. So here in Baltimore City, um, we have one EPA monitor in the center of the city, um, and it's actually pretty new. The data only covers the year 2022. Um, prior to that, there was one monitor, and that monitor was about 10 miles um, west of the city, um, and or actually 10 miles east of the city. Um, and while I know that pollution doesn't really have a sense of, of city borders and lines, right? Like a pollutant doesn't know whether it's in Essex or whether it's in Baltimore proper, um, air pollution does and often does vary um, on spatial scales. So sometimes neighborhoods next to each other can experience very different air pollution levels. Um, and so the response that here in Baltimore has been the call for more monitoring, um, as well as the call for the shutdown of pollutant sources. So again, here's that really large incinerator here um, and Clean Air Baltimore, which is a local organization that seeks to fight for air pollution mitigation in the city. Um, had a die-in back in 2019 um, where they, in response to the incinerator here, and so you can see they're, they're demanding clean air, they're demanding the shutdown of things like incinerators. Um, the other response, um, both from Clean Air Baltimore and from the population kind of at large, has been the establishment of small purple air monitors, um, and purple air monitors are smaller versions of the EPA monitor that like kind of suck in air and people can install them in their homes or in public places. These monitors tend to be a little more expensive uh, and they also require Wi-Fi. And I would say that because of these kind of prereqs, um, the placement of these stations, at least here in Baltimore, are not fully representative of the population. Um, so we often find purple air monitors in wealthy, predominantly white neighborhoods. Um, and while the same thing can be said of trees, um, right, at least here, trees can kind of be found mostly in wealthy white neighborhoods. Um, there are government incentives to increase tree plantings and tree canopy, um, right? So there is money in planting trees and there is also a big focus on the EJ planting of trees. So thinking about which communities lack tree canopy and where can we place them? Um, whereas, at least in terms of purple air monitoring networks and larger monitoring networks, um, there's not that much of an incentive to increase them, partially because um, the government doesn't control purple air, um, the people do. And so I think with the knowledge that tree planting incentives are increasing and there, there is this body of literature um, going back and forth about whether trees are improving air pollution, um, I want to know if we could use them to fill this gap in air pollution monitoring, right? And so can we use air pollution or trees to, to detect differences across space? Um, and so I observed three common heavy metals in the Baltimore atmosphere. We looked at chromium, nickel, and iron, um, and the goal was to capture spatial differences in air pollution concentration. Um, but there were a couple of things that we kind of had to do before we could get there. So we developed a sampling strategy based on our understandings of uh, pollution deposition onto tree surfaces, um, where we waited over prolonged dry periods. So dry periods of about a week um, the suns here on the slide don't represent a week, but I, there's so much space in a PowerPoint slide. Um, but we went out and sampled at the mid crown of a tree on the last day of a dry period. So the day right before it rained. Um, and then after it rained, we came back and collected through fall, which ostensibly would be what had been rinsed off by the rain. And then we also collected a post rain leaf sample to validate this idea that pollutants were being washed off by the rain. Um, and so the assumption here is that the total pollution measured in the through fall plus what was measured on the, the post rain leaf would be equal to the dry. Um, I think another way of saying that is that the dry pollution would be washed off in the rain um, and most of that would be present in the through fall. Um, and I think part of this was to ask the question of whether or not that pollution is being washed off by the rain um, are we getting a really hard reset on tree leaf surfaces um, so that we can say like definitively that this amount of pollution was deposited um, at this point of time or over this um, 
series of time. And so these samples um, were processed and analyzed through ICPMS or mass spectrometry. Um, and when we received the data back, we noticed that our original assumption that dry leaf sample being equal to the through fall and post drain sample was completely wrong. Um, so I have here a graph um, with the average concentration um, of a metal for each type of sample. And so on the left uh, is our dry leaf sample, in the middle is our through fall sample, um, and on the right is our post rain leaf sample, um, and each graph represents a specific metal. Um, and so you can kind of see that the story is different for each of these metals, which implies that pollutants are not necessarily being rinsed off. It also implies that some metals actually prefer um, specific types or modes of deposition. Um, and so chromium, which is on the top, um, seems to really prefer a dry deposition, right? And so we can see that like the box is taller um, for dry when compared to the through fall and compared to the post rain leaf. Um, the median is higher um, in that dry deposition. Whereas for iron, it doesn't seem to be that there is really a big difference between the three, at least in terms of, of their average or their medians. Um, and then alternatively, nickel, which is on the bottom, really seems to prefer um, that post rain leaf sample, right? It's a lot more present um, in the post rain compared to the dry or to the through fall. Um, and so I think this is really important specifically when we speciate pollutants um, because things are showing up in places where others are not, right? So all three samples seem to be important in terms of understanding the full story, especially in situations where a, a metal might prefer one mode of deposition compared to the other. Um, but it also seems to imply that um, at least for these three metals, there isn't really that, that wash off or complete reset. Um, dry is not always the, the largest um, for each of these metals, um, which means that our pollutants are kind of being deposited at all times. Um, and so because each metal has its own pathway, I think that when we're thinking about trees as biomonitors, we have to be cognizant of that when we're trying to understand those spatial differences. Um, I want to focus on chromium in particular. Um, and so I, again, am trying to answer this question of spatial variation, so I made a map. Um, and so um, on the right here, we have that same map of that heat map that I showed you earlier that depicts the, the density of, of industrial sources of pollution. And then each site that I sampled at um, has a circle and that the color of the circle is representative um, of the, the, the concentration of dry chromium, right? Um, and so I think the fullest story for chromium at least is the dry sample. And we can kind of see that there is a spatial difference across the city, right? And so um, sites in the Northeast are, are higher than sites in the West. Um, but we do have sites that are next to each other, but behave really opposite to each other, despite being so close. So I think specifically of CPG and MPE, which are in the, the south um, west of Baltimore, or even HRP and MRP, which are in the um, east or like northeast of Baltimore. Um, and so we also can see um, with HEP, if we go far enough away from the, the sources or the, the fog of pollution sources, we get values that are really close to zero. Um, and so I think questions here or next steps here are understanding what these spatial differences might be related to. Um, I think some of these sites imply industry, right? So sites that are really close to this fog um, or the smog tend to have higher concentrations and it actually kind of lines up with the, the predominant winds here in Baltimore, which in the summertime come from the West um, and from the Southwest. Um, and so sites that are like North um, and Northeast tend to be a little bit higher than those sites that are um, in the West. Um, but I also think it's important to note that traffic is not mapped in this. And so when we add traffic onto it, it kind of becomes difficult to distinguish um, whether or not or which of the two is more important in terms of understanding those concentrations of heavy metals. Um, and so I think another thing that we're thinking about is being sure that we're able to relate this to what the EPA measures. Um, if we want to utilize trees as that monitoring network and as a way of understanding um, kind of how um, pollution looks for different people and different neighborhoods, 
um, we kind of want to be able to compare our measurements either to the purple air monitor measurements or even to the EPA measurements. Um, and so currently what I'm working on in my thesis is being able to, to make relationships between those two. Um, and so I think before I kind of uh, close out, there are some kind of recaps or things to think about um, or things that we know for sure. One of them is that urban areas face a lot of air pollution, which has environmental and health implications, right? So there are um, problems with, with pollution sources in urban areas and even in non-urban areas um, that are affecting people um, and infecting our environment. And we have to figure out a way to, to be aware of that. We also know that trees might be able to help us in detecting those differences in air pollution, um, but that dry leaves alone don't tell the entire story, right? Some pollutants are really um, into wet deposition as opposed to dry deposition. Um, and it's important to kind of gather all of those pathways in order to get a full story. Um, and then finally, I think more research or, or questions are more probing can be done in terms of understanding the use of trees as biomonitors for this air pollution, specifically as we think about um, how we can relate this to what the EPA measures um, in order to create like stronger networks of knowledge um, when it comes to understanding our pollution. Um, before I like fully close out, I want to say thank you to the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, to the Baltimore Green Space, the Shriver Center at UMBC, and out to Innovate for funding and supporting my research. And thank you all for listening today. And I'll stop my share. Thanks so much, Drew. What an interesting talk, and I'm learning a lot here. I don't know anything about chromium, so that's a first for me. So thank you so much. Um, now what we normally do is open it up for questions. So if folks want to raise their hands with the little raise hand button, um, we can ask Drew some questions. And, and if you're not comfortable asking questions in person, feel free to um, put them in the chat, and Eric and I can... Um ask them as well. I guess I can just ask one. I always talk too much, so I try to give some space. But um, Drew, do you know like who the air quality people are in the Boston area? Like, what would be your your go tos for um, comparing? You you said the purple air community monitors. I haven't seen those around as much up here. Um, can you just speak to like? Yeah, who who are the who are the air people if you know them, um, and like what would be your recommendations for installing air monitors? I'm thinking a little bit about like the mayor's office of new urban mechanics, maybe helping get those equitably distributed in areas up here. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, I'm not sure the of the air people in Boston. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of air people down here in Baltimore who have different opinions, partially because we have a lot of, um, there. there's, you know, like the government side of air monitoring, which comes federally from the EPA, but also from the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, and then smaller local nonprofits that are really focused on, on like equitable air pollution mitigation. Um, and so I think when we're thinking about air pollution monitors and, and where to place them and where they can go, um, the first thought that I have is you want to put them nearby pollution sources, um, not because, partially because I think that when we think about purple air and the fact that it's accessible online, that helps people to be able to keep sources of pollution accountable, right, or polluters accountable um, with information, because I think not all sources of pollution are required to re to report their emissions. Um, there are a couple of like eligibility rules that um, actually exclude some people from or some organizations from having to report their their pollution concentrations that they emit. Um, and so, putting monitors nearby them helps people to have that information in a way that is 
like accessible at all times um, and easily understandable, but then also putting them in areas where we, we have questions about health, right? And so um, I think about Curtis Bay, which is um, South Baltimore or Brooklyn in general, and a lot of their concerns with their, their, their health is that um, Curtis Bay has some of the highest asthma um, occurrences or asthma diagnoses um, in the entire city. And so their, their explanation for that is being close to the incinerator, is being placed nearby um, other sources of pollution, including construction. Um, and so if we have high health issues here and are trying to understand the cause of those high health issues or um, exacerbated health issues, when we monitor the, the air, right, in those places, we're able to say whether or not, or we're, we're able to relate them to kind of like cross out the, the causals or the causalities of those things. Hey, Dexter here. Thanks for such a great, oh, I'm sorry. Mara has her hand up. No, you can go for it, Dexter. You go first. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, absolutely fascinating. Really interesting from a um, sampling design perspective, practical perspective. Um, if you were to do this again, what would you do differently? Mm, I think when I first started, I did not have any GIS experience, nor did I know that you could utilize, I think, my time in GES has taught me a lot about community source data. Um, and my knowledge of community source data in some ways came later compared to, I think, when it would have been helpful. And so when I look at my the distribution of my sites, I don't think that they're completely representative of the pollution like fog. And so I think that in terms of my like sampling design, um, being able to, to, to sample in places that were really central to that really dark, those dark areas in that heat map, um, as well as sampling in areas that were really far out would have helped to be able to like have that sense of, of, or really be able to answer that question more clearly of whether or not sites or being close to sites, um, are able to, or being, whether or not being close to sites is related to the amount of pollution that um, we find. Um, I also think that this is kind of funny in that um, you go and collect data and then you do all of your math and then you're like, wow, I need more data. <laughs> um, I wish that I had um, like another summer to collect more samples so that um, I could be more thorough. And so um, maybe I would have also tried to sample in more forest patches across Baltimore City. Um, but I think Dexter is, is like someone in Baltimore with the Forest Service, you know, um, that distribution still isn't fully representative of the entire city. We have areas that are kind of like naked in terms of um, tree canopy, but are very full of that industry. And so I think an expansion of the placement of my, my sites would have been helpful um, with that knowledge of, okay, where are the pollution sources? beyond just the incinerator or beyond just traffic. Thanks, Drew, appreciate it. So, sorry if I missed this, I had to step away for a minute. Um, I had a question for someone who's looking into purchasing and installing portable air devices. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, what is sort of, I mean, I've read a little bit about them. I, I know, you know, how wonderful they are, but I also understand they're, they're challenging, right? For you know, different reasons. What's your advice on like how to roll them out? Um, you know, how to cite them, how to engage community around them, how to, you know, ensure that they're working and functioning. Like if I were to buy 10 purple air devices, sort of like, what's your manual? Success. Yeah, I think. Hmm, I think in terms of like, com like community engagement, 
is seeking out communities that have been really open or um, really focused on air quality, right? And so like they will have knowledge about where or like what areas um, are kind of areas of concern or areas where people um, are um, that kind of like need that information. I think um, when we think about like the purple air monitor, someone else in our department looked at that distribution, at least here in Baltimore, um, and again, found that they like they skew wealthy um, and really like away from communities that would be uh, like affected by pollution in theory. Um, so, so we have like this population of people that were like, oh, we're so worried about air pollution, but um, it's funny when you look at their their numbers compared to like the EPA's numbers and their numbers are always so much better. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, well, um, I guess you're, you all are fine. Um, so I think in terms of like rollout is, is having, trying to like, trying to do a widespread um, geographically in terms of, of under, and, and like, I think that comes from understanding who or what or where there are areas of concern, right? And that information comes from the community, right? Um, I think in terms of like time, we know that air pollution in the summer in some places tends to be lower in concentration compared to um, in the winter time due to increases in traffic and other forms of fossil fuel burning. Um, and so maybe using the summer time to like get everything right so that you're ready for winter um, to, to really be able to, to monitor and observe um, and try to like work from there. And sorry, just a follow up. Um, what about like the technical side of things on like mm. proper siting or power and Wi-Fi, those types of things? Yeah, I mean, I think I have never like cited a purple air monitor. Um, I, I think I'm for better or worse, just aware of the network. I know that um, I know that they require Wi-Fi. I'm unsure about how people handle that. Um, I think a lot of people probably utilize like little hotspots or the ability to kind of like, if you pay for a hotspot and have it in a place, then you're able to connect it to the Wi-Fi. Um, and then in terms of siting, I think that there are, at least for the outdoors, rules about or general recommendations about the height, right? And so you wouldn't place a monitor. I think people place monitors at the, the average height of a human being to best understand the 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 exposure that a person would experience, right? So like I'm not on the, I'm, I'm a certain height. Um, and so what does the air look like at that height? Um, placing them away from trees, interestingly enough, because of that kind of like concern about trapping. Um, and then also thinking about, uh, I guess like keeping the monitor there, right? I think some people have concerns about monitors going missing or breaking and things like that. And I think that would be a question for kind of like the people in that community, right? Like, is this a place to put this? Um, what are the thoughts there? Thanks, Drew. Um, I think we talked about this once before, but I had a, um, I had a really interesting, like when I first started at Mass Audubon, a really interesting question about a crematory expansion. People were worried about toxins in air from a crematorium. And I never expected to learn anything about crematories in this job, but it turns out I had to learn like kind of a lot. Um, still don't know everything about it, um, but uh, I was just thinking about zoning. So like how zoning intersects with, you know, the trees, but also the air quality in different places. So um, did you ever come across like weird like not just like what you think of with industry and traffic, but did you ever come up, come across like kind of these other potential sources of toxins that people were or weren't concerned about? Um, mm. Yeah, I think I'm trying to think of some like weirder uh, like toxins or areas. I think we, we have, there's the Domino Sugar Factory down here. Um, which um, I like wasn't close enough um, to be able to sample from. Um, but when I was going through like my OpenStreetMap data, I was shocked that that came up as, as industry. 
Um, but then I was like thinking about the fact that I don't really understand how sugar like gets processed like through a factory. Um, but they they have a smokestack. They're required to report their emissions to the EPA. Um, you know, and so sometimes you can collect that data. Um, it's not speciated, right? Like they, I think they're just kind of like ozone, you know, um, particulate matter, like in general, as opposed to to species. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I I I don't I don't know that crematoriums came up in the industry search, um, which might be interesting to kind of go back and look at. Um, but in terms of weird sources of pollution here my first thought is, is like the sugar factory because it's kind of funny, like who would have thought? Super interesting, yeah. And, and that was something that came up with the community was like, okay, they're required to just tell how much ozone or particulate matter is coming out of these, um, they're called like retorts, I guess, <laughs> is the mm -hmm. word for the <laughs> crematory stacks. And um, they were very concerned about mercury. We have a really old victory garden across the street from this place, mm -hmm. which is already operating as a crematory, but it wanted to expand. So people were really curious like about mercury in the air and how you would, how you would deal with that. Um, and we were kind of finding ourselves wish wishing we had soil samples from before something happened. So um, maybe your work kind of makes a case or, or some other work that's similar to this makes a case for like studying these things before um, new uses or expanded uses go into place. Yeah, I definitely think thinking about like time series or, or, or interventions is helpful because um, we actually see that there's a difference like throughout the summer. And so um, when the EPA measured pollution from May to, to August, which was in our, our sampling um, like time frame, um, there was this huge spike kind of like at the beginning of July. Um, and our some of our sites corresponded with that spike and were kind of also like really high. Um, but part of that reasoning for their their like increase in that spike was because they were close by the EPA uh, monitor. And so it was kind of like, okay, well, we're seeing this huge spike, like what happened? Um, and so I think being able to know what that that intervention is, right? Understanding like, what happened um, or what is the cause of this, this spike or this increase or this change. Um, I think at least with, with trees, you know, they're, they're already there usually, um, right? Or they, they can kind of like be easily placed there um, and can give you a little bit more information, not only about the air, but also about um, like other concerns, right? And so like you're saying, like soil samples, um, in some cases, I think I, I, there is someone whose last name I'm forgetting, but her first name is Tiana, who who did a talk in at, at our GES seminar, um, and she was looking at tree cores over time, and so she had found um, like pollutants, the pollutant concentration in tree cores um, were changing, and she was able to tie that back to um, like events in that town's like specific history. Any more questions for Drew? There was one um, suggestion in the chat to talk about green burial. I think that'd be really cool. I don't know if we've discussed that in this group before, but uh, I think that'd be really cool. Um, and I'll just leave some space for anyone else who might have a question for Drew. Amara, go ahead. Hey, Drew. Thanks so much for um, giving this talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was curious if you've looked at, this might be like that next step for looking at like that local spatial variation, but um, like, have you looked at canopy cover like in Baltimore and like how that um, is like contributing or influencing um, air pollution? Like I know people talk about like the role of trees, um, like as like, um, 
like in their ability to reduce air pollution. But I don't know if that's kind of like a part of your question. I'm just curious to know more. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question that I haven't specifically um, explored. But I think a lot of the literature that looks at canopy, well, I think that there are like two like houses of, of, of thought. Um, one of them is that individual trees are helpful, right? Like if we plant a bunch of street trees, that will reduce the pollution that we're seeing from cars. Um, but that area of thought doesn't consider um, like street trees compared to, to microforests, right? And all of the environmental um, benefits or services that are provided by by forests as a pair as as opposed to individual trees. Um, but then we also have this kind of like in terms of air pollution school of thought um, that looks specifically at like forested areas compared to open areas, so no trees. Um, and so I think that those groups find different things in terms of pollution mitigation, right? So um, there's this one study I'm thinking of that um, they looked at uh, like a, a forest patch and, and like a grass field. And oftentimes these places were like right next to each other. Um, and they did this in like four cities and the results weren't the same across the city. Um, and so my imaginings for why that is, why in some cities a forest like improves um, the the gaseous pollutants or even the PM, but in other cities it like holds on to it or makes it worse. Um, might be related to to tree species. Um, might be related, which like in terms of tree species, there are, are there's literature about like different characteristics of trees that change or affect a tree's ability to remove pollution, right? So having trichomes or tri yeah, I think trichomes or like having hairy leaves. Um, for some pollutants is helpful. Um, having a larger leaf surface for some pollutants is helpful. Um, but um, in terms of other, uh, I think another reason that those things can be be different from each other is also like the, the atmospheric conditions and the pollutant makeup of a specific city, right? And so um, I think, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but um, this question of kind of like, differences or, or the use of um, or comparing canopy versus pollutants has a lot of, of room for growth in terms of and like a lot of room for research because there are so many different things that can affect a canopy whether that is um, the size of the canopy the species makeup of the canopy and even its location. Thanks, Thanks so much Drew. Drew. Do you have a um do you have like a favorite paper that you would recommend us read? Okay, if you don't. Uh, I can I can send one out. Um I'll look, but there there are like a couple that are kind of like funny <laughs> in terms of like their findings. Um or are confusing because they say one thing and then they're like, yeah, and then we went to Europe and it was completely different. And you're like, what's not completely different when you go to Europe? <laughs> um yeah, but I'll I'll definitely look around. All right, great. Well, thanks so much, Drew. Um, we really enjoyed learning from you today and hope to see you again. Um, oh, um, Mike says, Drew, what is that open versus canopy paper? That sounds like a useful exploration. So if you want to find that one and um, yeah. send it over to us, we can send it out when we send out the recording of your talk today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Drew. Uh, Erica, any announcements about our next meeting? Um, not right at this moment. I'll do it through the um through the Google um through the Google group. Uh, I'm on the road today, so I'm actually like I've been in a Panera Bread this whole time, and I will um, get myself together by the end of the week. <laughs> and then Drew, when you uh, when you arrive in Boston, Boston, uh, <laughs> drop a line. We'd love to uh, meet you in person. I, I'm jealous that Erica gets to work with you, but we're not not too far. So yeah, I think we're all connected, which is a fun yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, are you familiar with the work of, I think it was Jenna Rindy? Mm -hmm. Jenna and I um, were in okay. the same lab when I was at BU. Oh, I keep up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You have that BU connection already, mm -hmm. right? All right. All right. Great job. And thanks, Thank everybody. You. Hope everybody Thank has a, a great rest of your May and we'll see you in June. Bye bye.